There's one story of a Christian who was uh, in desperate situation. Who was in desperate situation and uh, he went to the beach and he walked on the, on the beach and he, he was asking God and asking God why his life was so uh, why his life was so uh, you know down. He was desperate. He's in terrible situation. Amen. And he wants God to give him an understanding of what he's going through. And as he walked on that beach, God impressed to him, did you see this ocean? And God impressed to him, you know, this ocean never dry. Amen. This ocean never dry. The water will never dry. So it means that God is the one who's, uh, who's the one who's uh, providing everything. Abundantly providing for everything. And uh, that Christian, that, that man, was holding a cup of water. And God impressed to him one verse in the Bible that says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways are higher than your the new ways as the heaven is high above the earth that's how his thoughts and his plans and his ways are higher than our ways amen so if you look up the cup you can see just the the, the a small water the amount of water that is in your cup compared to the vastness of the water of the ocean that is in front of you the Lord was saying, this is my ways, bigger than your ways, higher than your ways. Amen. This water in the ocean compared to the water in your cup. So in our lives, may, there are many things that are uh, happening to us, but that we question God because we don't understand. We don't understand His ways. We don't understand His plans. And He wants us Amen. To remember. Right? Because we are like sheep. We always tend to go astray. Because as a sheep, like a sheep, we easily forget. Amen. The road, the path that the shepherd is leading us. And thank God for his word. That through his word, we can remember his promises to us. We can remember His amazing and wonderful promises upon our lives. Amen. So we're going to look at the book of Psalms 119, verse 49. Have you heard this verse in Psalms 119, verse 49? Wala nakarinig sa inyo? Sinabi ni Halsey, ah. You already forget. See? Madali tayo makalimut. And that verse, of, of course, we still uh, continue with our series of teaching about the living word of God. And our title for today's message is Word of Hope, Word of Life. Can we say it loud? Word of Hope, Word of Life. So in Psalms 119, 49, 50, in NKJV version, it says, Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction for your word has given me life. We bless the Lord for the reading of his word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that today, O oh God, Lord, we ask you, God, Lord, to give us, O oh God, a spirit of understanding, O oh God. By your mercy, O oh God, Lord, we have come to your, to your throne today, O oh God, Lord, to your presence. Lord, by your mercy, by your grace, give us a spirit of discernment, O oh God, Lord. A spirit of wisdom, a spirit, Lord, holiday of knowledge, understanding, O oh God, of the words that we're going to hear today. Lord, we cancel any destruction. Hallelujah. Contrary to your word, every, every high thing that, that, that uh, 
Hallelujah. Excel against the knowledge of God. Lord, we bind it in the name of Jesus. Lord, we commit to your ways, O God, to your will today, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. Psalms. How many of you have read the book of Psalms? The book of Psalms is composed of individual songs. Amen. You can say that Psalms also can refer to the song of songs. Or awit sa Tagalog. Amen. So because Psalms is composed of individual songs, hymns, and uh, poems also. And some of the chapter in, in the book of Psalms contain praises, worship to God, and also in this, in this uh, book you will see a songs of cry, a songs of anguish, amen, a songs of uh, pain. So we can see that uh, the Psalms also look forward in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So, we are living in a troubled world. Right? There's no question about that. Lagi natin sasabi, lagi na lang may problema. Bakit? Why? Why? There's always problem. There's always struggle. There's always, uh, we can say, pain in this world. As Jesus said in John 16.33, I have these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have what? Tribulation. In the other version, it troubles. You will have troubles. But Jesus said, take heart. I have overcome the world. You know, all of us share the same destiny. Whether you are righteous or wicked, you are rich or poor, all of us experiences trouble. Amen? All of us experiences pain. Because we are in this world. This world is not perfect. This world tends to decay. This world is corrupt. This world is imperfect. Why it's imperfect? Of course, God created this world perfect. But it becomes imperfect because of what? Because of sin. Amen? Because of sin. Our sin. And uh, whether you are good or bad, clean or unclean, uh, uh, King Solomon said, all is vanity. All of us struggle. The good struggle, the sinful struggle. So, hallelujah. The war, in this world, you will experience discrimination, you will experience unfair, unfairness. And he says, the same thing happens to each one of us. Whether you are in your office, you will experience what? Partiality. You will experience injustices. Why we live in this earth? Because the end of all life in this earth is what? Death. Amen. We will become what? Corrupted. We will be corrupted. When we die, we will be buried and we will decay. Hallelujah. So no matter how you take care of your body, no matter how many minerals or vitamins you will take, Amen. Hallelujah. That's the reality. Our body will die. And uh, when we, many people, when they suffer, they blame God in many things. They blame God is responsible of all their troubles. Many, many people yelling to God that God is is bias, God is unjust, God is unfair. And uh, many people pointing their fingers to God, blaming Him as the cause of their sufferings, blaming God as the cause of pain. 
in their lives. Like the generation of those who came out of Egypt. Remember them? When they are hungry and thirsty, they blame God. When they lusted for food, they complain. They are saying, oh, we remember Egypt. The meat that we are eating in Egypt, the fish that we are eating, the onions, the leeks, and the cucumbers, the melons. They remember Egypt, a land of slavery, because they complain against God. They want to blame God of their uh, trouble in the wilderness. And uh, they, they, they even said that we, our whole being is dried up because of this, this bread, this manna, this worthless bread. You know, for 40 years, God provided for them bread every morning, right? They gather bread. The manna, they call it manna. Every uh, six days, they will gather, gather bread. Amen? And, uh, but after that, they complain to God. And even Moses complained to God. Do you know that? Moses complained. He's telling God, where can I get meat to, the, to these people you gave me? Amen? And he said, I'm not able to carry all these people alone. He's complaining to God. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me now. Kill me at once. Moses, the great man of God. Praise the Lord. Because many times we don't understand His plan for us. You know, God is a perfect God. We people, we measure, we measure uh, up wisdom by the standard of man. We measure up holiness by the standard of man. We, we measure up righteousness by the standard of man. But come to think of it. If He is a perfect God, He is the perfect wisdom. He is the perfect what? Strength. He is the perfect, uh, uh, is a perfect love. Everything is perfect to God. Everything that you can see is perfect in beauty, is perfect in, in, in joy. Everything is perfect because He is God. You know? That's what I was meditating this morning when I was praying. I said, I said, oh God, Lord, thank you because I have a perfect God. And one day I will be with you, the perfect God forever and ever. You know, that's the downside of that is when, when I was meditating on the perfectness of God, I'm just saying, God, when will you take me? When will you take me out of this imperfect world where there's so many pain? Amen. Hallelujah. Because God is, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the, the, the hope. Amen. As Sister Ramon said, the hope that we have. That one day we'll be with him in eternity. Praise the Lord. That's why sometimes when, when you give me trouble, I'm telling God, Lord, when will you take me out of here? <laughs> Just like Moses. <laughs> I was laughing when I, when I read this one. Wow. So it's natural. To tell God, Lord, take me home. <laughs> so we are blaming God because we struggle to get a job. We blame God when we are sick. We blame God because you blame God because of your husband. You blame God because of your wife. Like Adam, right? Adam said to God, when God asked him, where are you? Have you eaten the fruit that I said, do not eat? You know the reply of Adam? You know, because of, of this woman you gave me, <coughs> I ate this fruit. 
So blaming God because of your parents, your children, blaming God for your hair, blaming God for your nose, maybe your skin color, everything we blame God. And people blame God because of their, you know, they are confused about their gender. Have you, have you heard some people said, God made a mistake in giving me a man's body with a woman's heart. <laughs> That's blaming God. God, you made a mistake. Why give me a woman's heart in a man's body? Because they are confused. They don't understand. The same way for those lesbians, right? Why are you giving me a man's heart in a woman's body? And many people who are, so many young people are very confused about their gender. They don't know now. And uh, the world has been branding many names about what is your sexual, uh, you know, status. Of course, some people are, who are playing sexually with girls or boys, they are blaming God. They will say, why you blame me? Amen. God may be a person who lives a life in pursuit of pleasure. Who lives a life devoted to pursuit of pleasure. Like that, because we don't want to own our responsibility. That's why... There's tribulation and trouble in this world because of sin, not because of God. He, he didn't cause trouble. He didn't cause sin. Amen? It is us who is disobedient to Him. And it is because we try to go distant from God that there are so much suffering and death. In Romans 5, it says, Sin entered the world because, because of Adam. Amen. And death through sin. And in the way of death came to all people because all sin. All of us. No one is perfect. So without God, living a life here on earth is pointless and meaningless. Thank God for Jesus. He said there, he conquered the world. Jesus is all triumphant. Amen. It says in Colossians 2, 13, 15. It says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. You can see He has forgiven us. Sins that we cannot pay. The wages of sin we cannot pay. The penalty of sin we cannot pay. Jesus paid it for us. And God has forgiven us of all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, He has taken it away. He nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, by the cross. You can see there. Hallelujah. He made a public display of the enemies. Amen. In ancient time, when a general conquered nation and he will uh, he will imprison or he will chain all those uh, uh, enemies. And there will be a parade. With them, amen, in chain. The enemies in chain. The enemies who were what? Naked. To embarrass them. To put shame to them. That's what Jesus did. When he was, when he triumphed over the cross. He put shame to the enemy. Praise the Lord. So, he said, I have told you. That in me you will have peace. We can have confidence in Jesus. We can have 
We can take courage from Him. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Are you an overcomer? You're not convinced. How do we become an overcomer? It says there, for everyone who has been born of God. Whenever you see the word born of God, it means born again. Okay? Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the word. And this is that victory that has overcome the word. Our faith. They got it? That's why we walk by faith, not by sight. Who is it that overcomes the word? Except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe Him as the Son of God? When you believe Him as a Son of God, you believe that He is God. Amen. That's why when, when He asked the, the disciples, who do people say that I am? And the disciples said, they are saying, you are Jeremiah, you are John the Baptist, you are one of the prophets. And He turned to the disciples, and who do you say I am? And through, amen, the revelation from the Father, he gave to Peter. Peter said, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Peter. Because flesh did not reveal it to you. Flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And from this rock, I will build my church. And no gates of hell shall prevail against it. What is that rock? This revelation, from this rock, from this revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what is happening now? Why they are saying that we are church and they don't believe Jesus as God? They don't believe Jesus as the Son of God. That is not church. Amen? The only church that God is building is the church that is built to Jesus the Son of the living God. Through that revelation. And we are overcoming because of, of that. Because we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Through faith. Through faith. Amen? Through faith in where? where? The Bible. Through faith in what the Bible is saying. The living word of God. Believers are triumphing in Christ because we are born again. We are born of God. We overcome the world. We overcome the world. Are you excited? Yes. You are overcomer. You are an overcomer and you overcome the world because of our faith. That's why things will come. I mean, to, we are not immune of problem. We are not immune of affliction or suffering. That's not what the Bible promised to us. That's not what God promised to us. That when you become born again, there will be no problem. When you become born again, there will be no suffering. No. That is the lie of the devil. I'm sorry to say there are churches who are preaching that kind of doctrine. The lie of the devil. That when you become a Christian, you will be, know, what? You will be wealthy. You, should, you will not become poor. You will not suffer. You will not get sick. There's so many teaching about that. But that is not biblical. It's a lie of the enemy. Amen? You want, he wants, you, God wants you to build your faith upon His Word. Not upon the, the Word of men. Amen? The doctrines of men. That's why you need to read the Bible properly. You need to understand what the Bible is saying. Hallelujah. Through the help of the Spirit, God will give us the understanding. And He wants us to remember where there is life, there is hope. Do you know that? It says in Ecclesiastes 9, 4 to 5, King Solomon had written, amen, this book. And it says, He who is joined with all the living has hope. I believe there's no dead here. All of us are alive. 
So you have hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. See? A dead lion is useless. Lion is bold. Lion is brave. But if the lion is dead, it's useless. Amen? It's better a living dog than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. I don't know if many of if some of us here are still hoping to their dead family. That is so sad. They are not here anymore in this world. They don't have any any uh, association now in this material world. When they die, they don't know what is happening now in this world. That's it. Amen? Their time has ended here on earth. That is the truth. If I'm a little rude, sorry, but that is the truth. When our parent, father or mother died, we don't have any more what? association with them. Don't pray to them. Amen? Don't hope in them. Because many people will say, Dad, I know you are praying for me. No. They cannot do that. They cannot see you here now anymore. No one. Because they are already dead. It says their memory of them is forgotten. But that is the word. The word system or the word, the word wisdom, the word, the word wisdom will tell us that you need to pray for them. You need to remember them always. Amen. When there's death anniversary, you need to celebrate because of their death anniversary. cannot do that anymore. I'm sorry. You are celebrating their death anniversary and you don't know where are they. You don't know if maybe they are suffering now and you are celebrating here on this earth. Isn't it? Praise the Lord. That's why when they are alive, take every opportunity. Talk to them. Amen. Love them. Share to them the gospel. Because this is the opportunity we can have to share them the hope that we have. To share them the life that we have. Hallelujah. Because only those who are alive has hope. When they died, when people died, they know nothing. Move on. God help us to remember His word. You know that? That's why He says in Psalms 119, the psalmist who, who has written that, didn't say that if it's David or Moses or anyone. It's just unknown. Amen. And you know Psalms 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. Because it was written, amen, section by section. It's like every alphabet, every Hebrew alphabet is there. Hebrew alphabet. So, it says, remember the word to your servant. Will God Will God forgotten His promises to us? He will not forget. It, right? But why the psalmist telling God, remember your word to your servant upon which you caused me to hope. You know when you say remember God, it means you are what? You are trusting God of His promises. You're not telling God, Lord, you've forgotten your promises. No. It's just saying that, Lord, I trust in your promise. This is your promise. I remember your promise. 
And I hold on to this promise that in the time of my affliction, I've been comforted because your word, this promise you gave me, gave me life. It revived me. Amen. And thank God because He wants us to remember His word through the help of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said that in John 14, 26. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you what? All things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. That is the Holy Spirit that's working in us. Not only He will, he will bring it to our remembrance, but he also He will teach us His word. Amen. I am not your teacher. It is the Holy Spirit who is teaching us today. Through the grace and the power of God. We have been taught and we understand because of the Holy Spirit. He helps us to understand. He helps us and He, guide, he guides us. So God helps us to remember His word. Amen? But the thing is, how many words, how many of His promises we remember? Or we have read? Or we have claimed? How many of His promises? Right? And how we will know His promises? By reading His Word. Amen? By studying His Word. By hearing His Word. By listening to His Word. You will know His promises to us. His promises to you and to me. Hallelujah. But if you will not read your Bible, how will you know His promises? Only every, every Sunday. Amen? Every seven days, you will hear promises from God. I think, hallelujah, it's very easy for us to forget that. Do you remember the topic last, last Sunday? See, you, you forgot already. Right? Beholding the glory of God. Because we easily forget that because we don't meditate on it. When we receive the word, it's only for Sunday. No. When we receive the word every Sunday, day, it's for the whole week. We meditate that. Lord, you are giving me this word. What it means to me. What it means to my life. To my job. What it means beholding your glory. You meditate on that. Keep on thinking. Pondering in your heart. Amen. Repeating and repeating it. The verses that you are you are hearing. Oh, this verse. John 14. What does it mean? Okay. Holy Spirit, you are the one who is, who is giving me. Uh, uh, you will help me to remember you, the word of Jesus. Or the word of God. And you will teach me. Hallelujah. That's how we meditate. That's how we, we keep on are reminding ourselves about the word of God. That's why it says in, in Psalms 1, Amen, blessed are those who are planted beside the rivers of water because they will not wither. The leaves will continue to be what? Fresh. Amen? Because they are planted by the rivers of water. Because he meditate on the word of God day and night. And in Joshua 1, it says, if you do that, you will have, you will prosper and you will have good success. You know, we are running after so many things to, to be successful. And we forget the simple thing that God is teaching us. Meditate on my word day and night and you will have good success. Why it says good? Because there are many success that is bad. You know that? There are bad success. But God is saying, good success. You will prosper and you will have good success. God helps us to remember His word. Not only that, God made us to hope in His word. In Romans 15, 4, it says, whatever things were written before, you know, Paul was saying, whatever things written before, in the scripture, in the Old Testament, it was written for our learning the story you are you are reading in the Bible, the story of kings, 
the story of prophets, the story of the, the nation of Israel. It says, it is given to us so that we will learn that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Hope. Very important for you to know where to put your hope. Amen. Because many people anchor their hope in their money, anchor their hope in their strength, anchor their hope in their own what? In their own plan and wisdom. But the Bible said, anchor your hope in Jesus. Like an anchor, it helps us to stay afloat because storms will come. Amen? To shake us. But if we are anchor in Jesus Christ, whatever storm, whatever waves that come across in our lives, we will not what? We will not go shipwrecked. We will stay afloat. Anchor your hope to His promises. Anchor your hope to His Word. And He's given us that. He made us to hope in His Word. Hallelujah. Where there is life, there is hope. You know, the devil's work to us is to forget His promises. You know that? There's one story, uh, there's one parable that Jesus said, the parable of the sower. And one of the type of soil that the seed was planted was a soil that was hardened. Amen? It means the soil, the heart that is hardened. That when the seed was, was uh, planted on that kind of heart, a hardened heart, it's easily what? snatched away by birds because it will not take root because the, the heart is so hard. Amen. And Jesus said, that's the kind of heart that don't understand the word of God. They come to church, they hear the word, but they don't understand the message. So it's easily being taken away from them, that seed, the word. They easily forget it. And Jesus said that bird is Satan himself. You know? We are thinking that, ah, oh, we are in the church. Satan is not here. Satan is looking for a heart that is hardened so that he can take away that seed. A heart that don't understand. And one of them are people who are sleeping. How can they understand if they are sleeping? <laughs> Satan is always with them. Beside them. Whatever they are receiving, Satan is taking away from them. <laughs> and they are so comfortable with that, sleeping. But they don't know that they are taking something that is precious from them. That is the word of God. Satan wants us to forget God's promises. That is his work. That's why Satan doesn't want us to read the Bible. Because in the Bible, it consists of more than 8,000 promises of God. Before they said 30,000 promises, which is so it's exaggerated. And one man, I think his name is Ever Strong. Amen. He spent one and a half years counting the promises of God. And he ended up more than 7,000, 8,000. Amen. And 7, 000, more than 7,000 to, to his promises to us, human beings. Of course, we don't know the exact, the exact number of his promises in the Bible. No one can know that. But the thing is, hallelujah, 
We cannot determine, but just like uh, the promises of God that, that uh, King Solomon said while he was praying, dedicating the temple, he said, not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave to his servant Moses. Not one failed. That's the important thing. How many of these promises have you known? Have known to you? And have you remembered? How many of these more than 7,000 promises of God? In Joshua 23, even Joshua himself, when he was old, amen, he conquered nations. He was an overcomer. And he told, he was telling this whole nation of Israel, he said, I am about to go away of all the earth. I'm old. But you know what? With all your heart and soul that no one of all the good promises the Lord God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Joshua, the overcomer, said that. God never failed. He will never fail. You know, the Bible records two types of promises from the Lord. Unconditional and conditional promises. Unconditional promises, for example, is a promise that there will be no more what? Flood. That is covenant. Amen. Whether you are good or bad, He will not send flood. It's unconditional because He promised. But there are conditional promises of God. Amen. The divine promises that are conditional. In other words, the Lord is willing to act under certain circumstances. Amen. If we will be responsible to do the condition that God is giving to us. For example, in salvation, it tells us that uh, if we confess with your mouth, amen, and uh, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That's conditional. You will be saved if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, all the promises of God, you will have deliverance. You will be saved if you believe in your heart. When it comes to uh, forgiveness, he said, if you confess with your mouth, amen, if, if you sin to God and ask for forgiveness, repent. If you repent to Him, acknowledging, admitting your mistake, your sin, he said, He's faithful and just to forgive us from all our unrighteousness. That's conditional. You need to repent. Conditional, when you ask wisdom, He said, if you will not doubt in your heart and ask wisdom from God, He will give you wisdom. If you will not doubt. So faith is very important when we are reading the Word of God. When we are claiming His promises. Hallelujah. God made us to hope in His Word. It says all things were written here for our learning that we might have hope through the Holy Spirit. And it says in 1 Corinthians 10, now these things happen to them as examples. You know those complainers in the wilderness? It happened. It's shown to us an example for our what? Warning, admonition. That it, it is warning us that complain, complaining before God is not good. They all died in wilderness because of complaint. They didn't reach the land of promise. See, the land of promise, they didn't reach because of complaint, murmuring. God's word comforts us. That's in verse 50 of 119. This is my comfort in my affliction. For your word has given me life. You know, comfort means what? You are relief or relieved. Comfort means you are helped. You receive help. 
you know, the word is full of trouble. The word is full, full of agony. The word is full of what? Anxiety, hurt, affliction, discomfort. It's fine to watch a funny movie for some time to make you like, laugh, laugh when you are a bit down. But I can tell you, you cannot rely on early things. Because what happened, it, it will not give you a lasting comfort. After you watch the movie, the suffering is still there. Because it, it cannot give you a lasting comfort. It can give you a temporary comfort. Even your friends, no matter how funny are they, they cannot give you the comfort that God can give. Amen. That's why the Bible says the word of God is like a cold water to a weary soul. It's like a good news to a weary soul. The gospel is a good news to a weary soul. Now it's very hot, right? When you stay outside or maybe you walk for a few miles and you become so thirsty. And somebody gave you cold water. That's the comfort that God is giving to us. It comforts us. It refreshes us. It revives us. It gives us life. Hallelujah. Do you know there are so many weary souls around us? How many of us can offer them a cold water to their thirsty soul? Hallelujah. The gospel of good news comforts the weary soul. You know, if you will read 51, what is the type of affliction or example of affliction that the psalmist had written? It's the affliction of mockery, rejection. The psalmist have written this because he was mocked, insulted, by his fellow man. Right? The arrogant, the proud, which unmercifully mock him. He said, but my comfort in this affliction is you are the one. Your word. I listen to your word. The word that I hope, that I give my hope, I put my hope upon, is the one that gives me life. Because if we meditate on our affliction, hallelujah, which is not good, we will end up what? Dry. We will end up what? Bitter. We will end as what? Disappointed. Amen? So why meditating on this word? And here is the word of God. Why meditating on the word of men? On the mockery of men? Hallelujah. Why fear them? Jesus said, do not fear those who can kill the body and, but cannot kill the soul, the soul. But rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Because we don't know that we are overcomer. It's very easy for us that Satan can trick us. Satan will tell us, you are nobody. Satan will tell you that you cannot progress. Satan will tell you that you are nothing. Because society will make joke of you, will criticize you. Many of us here still felt the pain of mockery. The pain of rejection by the society. The pain of being denied in your office. And the most terrible hurt you have experienced is being abandoned by your own family. Yes, it's a terrible affliction. But thank God, because it didn't end there. God has promises to us. Man will fail us. 
by His promises. But God will not fail us of all His promises to us. He remained faithful. It is impossible for God to lie. Amen. Hallelujah. God, His word is truth. And not only that, God's word comforts us and God is the source of all our comfort. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Hallelujah. God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Have you received the comfort of God? Amen. When you are weary, have you received His comfort? When you are desperate, have you received the comfort of God? You know, simple. When you are praying, God is there to embrace us. You know, when I was so down in my life, God was just, it's like, I'm here, son. I am embracing you. My embrace, that's, God's embrace is my comfort. That's it. It refreshed me. And it, re it can refresh us. You know, there are things in our lives you don't understand. But I'm always telling people, you know, my standard is, Lord, whenever I face problem, Lord, I know I don't understand why this is happening to me. Yes, it's not easy, it's difficult, but I know one day, Lord, I will understand why you brought me this kind of problem. And that day, I will thank you that you have given me this problem. Amen. Amen. That's how we need to confess our hope in God. That is our hope. Amen. Hallelujah. The devil will accuse you of many things. He will tell you to just sit on the corner and cry. Don't listen to him. He's a liar. And he's condemned. He's nothing. He's condemned. Amen. We are forgiven. He is condemned. He is, he is a loser and we are a winner because of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We need to confess that. Confess your faith. Confess your hope. That's how we deal in this life. You know, with all these problems, problems will come. And of course, they will go. Right? Hallelujah. Storms will come. But after the storm, it's a sunny day. Amen. Behind this storm is a sunny day. Always remember that. Hallelujah. You know, God is so pleased with those people when they are in trouble, they are praising God and thanking Him. You know, when, you are, where, where, when people are in the church and they are singing to God, God is looking for a heart that are broken and yet they are praising God. They are thanking God. He's not looking for those people who are, because they are so much blessing, they are rejoicing and clapping. God is looking for the heart that in every season of their lives, they are there because they fully trust in God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. But I'm not saying don't clap, don't jump, don't... <laughs> Show, of course, we need to show our our joy and and uh, our our gratefulness to God in all the things that He's doing to us. Hallelujah! Through our songs, to our to our to our singing. He is the God of all comfort. He is the source of all our comfort. You know, of all the creation of the world. We are the one, human being is the one, amen, whose God is giving comfort. Have you seen a dog who needs comfort? No, they don't need comfort. They are animals. Right? 
They don't understand that. But they will not understand that. Angels don't need comfort. They don't need comfort. Satan is outside comfort because he's already condemned. Amen? But we as human beings, we live in this world where we need it, where we need God's comfort, where we need our, our loved one's comfort. Our fellow human beings need comfort. That's why it said he right. God is a source of comfort. He comforted us so that we may comfort others. That's it. So how can you comfort others if you don't receive comfort? First, God will give you comfort. You will experience His comfort. And then you can give that to others. God gives to us. We receive it. And we also give. Hallelujah. And through the Holy Spirit, we said He's our comforter. He is our parakletos. You know, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit will, be, will always be with us. The God of all comfort. So why not instead of being a complainer, you become a comforter to others? Right? See? They become a comforter to others. Yes, in your trouble, ask God, Lord, I need your comfort so that I may comfort others. You know, when people were struggling in their lives, for example, they are looking for a job or they are sick, I will tell them one thing. Pray for those people. If you are sick, pray for those people who are sick. If you don't have job, pray for those people who don't have job. Because you're the first person who will understand their needs. Amen? And of course, God will listen to you because you understand it fully what that person is going through. If you need to pass, pass for them, fast for them. Sacrifice. Because they need, what you need is they need also. Praise the Lord. Because God doesn't want us. Amen? Hallelujah. He doesn't want to hear complain from us. Because complainers are those who don't trust in God. And they will not reach the land of promise. He is the God of all comfort. And Jesus, the word of God, said in John 10.10, 10, The thief comes only to steal, to, steal. to kill, and to destroy. Who is that thief? Not the person next to you. It is Satan, our common enemy. You know, sometimes I'm so saddened. I mean, when, when one sister complained to one, complain about a sister, a brother complain about the brother, a brother complain about the sister. You know, he's not your enemy. She's not your enemy. We have common enemy. That is Satan. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Against the spiritual host of wickedness. And that is Satan and his minions. Yes? We got so many minions. Evil minions. And what are their a mission? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. So he's the cause of our suffering, Satan, the devil. And he is working very hard, especially this time, because he knows that his time is short. He wants to bring more souls with him to hell. Because he has no rival. Remember the word? The song we, we have, Almighty, there is no rival. God has no rival because Satan is nothing to God. You cannot, he cannot compare to be an arch enemy because God has no rival. Satan is nothing to God. And Satan 
cannot defeat God, of course. So how can he hurt God? How can Satan hurt God? Through us. Because God loves us, every soul. God loves us. It is the way of Satan to hurt God when he's bringing souls to hell with him. That is his job to steal, to kill, and to destroy lives of people. He is the source of all this suffering. Sin, Satan, is the cause of all our trouble. And thank God, one day, He will be out of our sight forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. And we will be God forever. Amen. But thank God for Jesus. He came. He came. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. That Satan, Satan is already defeated. Amen. We as Christians are overcomers. That the enemy, amen, cannot steal from us. And the enemy cannot kill us. Amen? Hallelujah. And cannot destroy us because of Jesus. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You know, this was misinterpreted by many Christians. They thought, oh, when I become a Christian, I will not go poor. I will always have abundance. That is not what the Bible is saying. That is not what Jesus is saying. Life abundant means, amen, hallelujah, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That through him we have, our, uh, th we have now the, the meaning and purpose of life here on earth. When we have entered our personal relationship with God, that is the life that is abundant. We, became al we become alive. We become born again. That's the life abundantly. Not material things. You know, there's a story of, just a story, a make-up story, story. A man of a farmer who were, uh, who were, uh, been, uh, you know, he found a genie. You know genie? Just, genie is not true, huh? Just for the sake of this story. And the genie told the farmer, make a wish, and I will give it to you. Three wishes. But there's a condition. If you ask for something, your neighbor will receive double. The farmer, your neighbor. So the farmer said, okay, that's a good, uh, that's a good uh, deal. The farmer, okay, first wish, give me five acres of land. Okay, no problem. The farmer gave him five acres of land. But his neighboring farmer, he gave what? Double. Ten acres of land. And the next, he thought about it. Wow. Okay, I got five acres of land. This is my next wish. Give me 1,000 cows. Okay, no problem. 1,000 cows. But your neighbor will receive 2,000 cows. And then he became what? Very jealous about his neighbor. Huh? No, the third wish is this. Do you know? Do you want to know the third wish? Yeah. Or next week? <laughs> you want now? Yeah. Really? Yeah. The third wish is this. Because he was so jealous with his neighbor, because he's getting double. He said, okay, this is my third wish. Take off my one eye. Remove my one eye. Of course, the neighbor, the two eyes was taken. That's how bad our heart. 
So, how can you say abundantly when you are only thinking about material things? You will not be satisfied. That is not a life that is abundant. Right? Is that how we act sometimes? When we have seen our fellow believers amen, being successful, we are jealous. Amen. Let us repent to God if we have that kind of spirit and thinking. Because we don't understand what we have. Jesus is enough. He is our hope. Amen. Everlasting hope. Our everlasting life. He has given to us. Because we have the Son. He who has the Son of God has life. And we don't have, He who doesn't have the Son does not have life. Amen. Jesus is the source of life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said that. So as we remember His word, we should what? Obey it. Right? It's very important. The same chapter in Psalms 119, 55 to 56. He said, I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. This has become mine because I kept your precepts. Precepts is his commandments. Precepts is his word. He said, I keep your law. When I remember it, I obey it. Amen? You want to have a good result of what you are receiving? Obey the word of God. Hallelujah. To be wise. When we hear this message, believe it. And apply it in our lives. Hold on to His promise. Meditate on it. Hallelujah. Because things will happen, not good, not always good. Bad things happen to us. But thank God that God remembers His promise to us, upon which we cause us to hope that even in the time that is not good, in the difficult times in our lives, in affliction, we are comforted because we remember the word that gives us life, that revives us, that energizes us. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And lastly, I don't know if you have your Bible with you and you notice this word on top of 49. Zion. Remember I told you, Psalms 119 is a list of the, the Hebrew alphabet. And Zion is the seventh alphabet. The seventh alphabet of the Hebrew alphabet. Zion. You know Zion means? Zion. That's why there is, you can see this icon. That's actually the, the sign or symbol of that alphabet. That's why it's like that. It's because sign means weapon. <coughs> weapon. So when he said, remember the word to your servant from Psalms 119.49 to 56, you will see that is the part of the sign, the section of the alphabet of sign. And when you see that, you will see that it's about weapon. It's about battle. We are in a battle. Amen? When problems come, we are in a battle. You know, we are always in a battle of this life. We are fighting. And God is giving us His word. That's why He say, remember the word to your servant. That makes us triumph in this, in this affliction, in this difficulty. Zion. And the Bible says that sign also means sword. You know that? Sword. It also means sustenance or nourishment to us. It also means food. So that is what Psalms 119.49-56 means. 
We are in a battle. And we need His Word as our weapon. Hallelujah. Do you know that the Word of God is our weapon? Amen. Hallelujah. And it is what called in Ephesians 6, Sword of the Spirit. How many of you know, know about that? About the armor of God. You need to put on the armor of God. Read this Ephesians 6. Because the devil, the devil is there with his wiles, with his tricks. And he said, stand firm on your faith. Put on the armor of God. The belt of truth. Hallelujah. The breastplate of righteousness. The helmet of salvation. The, the, the uh, shield of faith. The gospel or the shoes of peace. And lastly, he said, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That is our weapon. All the first armor talks about defense. But the last one is said, the Word of God is our sword to offend the enemy, to strike the enemy, to attack the enemy. We as Christians will not just wait for his blow, for the enemy's blow. We have the power to attack him, to cut his head, to cut his feet, to cut his arms, to cut his tongue. Because the word of God is the sword of the spirit. Amen. But no matter how sharpened is your, your sword, or how shiny or how long is your sword, but if you are not using it, it's nothing. It's useless. It's pointless. So how you will use that? By faith. Confess it. You know? When you receive the word of God, hope in the word of God and confess it. You know, people, when they are struggling in money, I ask them, are you doing the word of God? Are, are you doing what God told us in Malachi? Remind him. Tell him, remember, Lord. You said in Malachi, if I will bring my tithes and my offering, you will rebuke the devourer for my sake. I'm telling him that. Tithing here, tithing people. That's the sword of the Spirit. You hold on, you believe in the promise of God, and you confess it, Lord, remember, remember to test you in doing this. You will rebuke the devourer for my sake. Remember the word to your servant upon which you caused me to hope. This is my what comfort because your word has given me life. So I'm asking you all to stand and we're going to pray. We will end his because the next week we're going to talk about the word of God as a weapon. Amen. To teach us. There is no lame Christian. Hallelujah. God wants us to stand firm, to stand strong. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. So we're going to pray today. I know God has spoken to us a lot of things. And in your personal devotion, meditate on what you have received today. Don't just Forget it. You will go out and you will forget it. Take it. Carry it with you. Amen. Let it what usher you throughout the week. This promise of God is ushering you. Amen. To your joy, to your hope, to your victory. Praise the Lord. And I'm telling people, don't just believe to your pastor. Read the word of God. If it's still there, if it's really there, right there in the Bible. You know, some people will stop you to read the Word of God. They will say, you will not understand. No. Here in this church, I'll tell people, read the Word of God. Don't just believe in me. Read the Word of God. Study it on your own. Amen. If you don't understand, we are here to help you, to assist you. We are just a call away, or a child, a message away. Pastor, I don't understand what God is saying. Help me on this. Let us study the word of God together. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Let's give him a clap of praise. And let us thank the Lord today. Amen. Hallelujah. God of heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word today. Really refresh us, oh God, Lord. It revive us, oh Lord. Thank you, Lord, that the weak hands have been strengthened, the weak arms have been strengthened, the feeble knees, oh God, have been strengthened today. Truly, oh God, your word gives life. Your word, oh God, refresh our souls. And thank you, Lord, for times like this, oh God, Lord, it's a great privilege for us to come together, oh God, to sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron, oh God. Lord God, that not only to be sharpened, oh God, but us, we are sharpened, oh God, Lord, as uh, sharper than two-edged sword, oh God, your word. We will use it, oh God, Lord, against every evil plan of the enemy in our lives. We pull down every stronghold. Hallelujah. We pull down every hiding that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing our thoughts to the captivity of Christ. To the obedience of Christ. And once that obedience is fulfilled, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our obedience will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Now we thank you, Lord, for today's for my brothers and sisters who have come and for those who God who are watching right now Lord speak more to us as we Lord study you God on our personal study you God Lord reveal more of yourself to us more of your word to us oh God Lord. that it will not only just be sown but it will be planted sown and and bear fruit in our lives it will bear fruit it will bear root downward and bear fruit upward, O oh God, in our lives. Hallelujah. That will bring glory unto you, God. Lord, as we submit everything to you, God, we resist the devil and he shall flee in the name of Jesus. You are in charge, O oh God, in our lives. In all, O oh God, the issues of our lives, you are in charge, Lord. As a father or a mother, O oh God, you are in charge of our family. As a worker, O oh God, you are in charge in our offices. Lord, in this church, O oh Lord, you are in charge. You are the Lord of all, the King of Kings. And thank you, Lord, that truly, O oh God, Lord, as my brothers and sisters, O oh God, Lord, hallelujah, have come today. There are things that God that they need in their lives. You promise, O oh God, if we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, you promise, O oh God, Lord, that all the things we, that we need will be added unto us. Lord God, here are my lovely brothers and sisters who have come today, denying, O oh God, their sleep this afternoon, denying, O oh God, whatever things that they will, that they important things that. They need to go. They have come today, O oh God, Lord, to worship you, to seek you. Lord, maybe they are in need, Lord, spiritually, O oh God, you will add to their lives, O oh God, Lord. Peace, joy, hallelujah. Comfort in their lives. God, if they need something, Lord, about material things, you are the one who will add it to their lives. If they need financial, financial blessings, O oh God, you are the one who will add it to their lives, oh God. In their lives, oh God, in their emotional part of their lives, oh God, Lord, relationship, oh God, you are the one, Lord, who will meet them in their point of need. Lord, thank you. We worship you, oh God, Lord, we honor you, God, for you deserve all the highest praise, thanksgiving, adoration. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. amen. The joy is in the house. Jesus is in the house. Amen. Amen. And we are full of strength and energy. Amen. The house is full of energy. Amen. Amen. And God is blessing us with this word. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all forever and ever.
Amen. Amen.